I have a feeling, my dear, you're going to enjoy this quite a lot. <laughs> Welcome back, young scholars. This is the second video on imperialism. And I have a feeling that the people who were colonized under imperial rule probably did not actually enjoy it all of that much. So the big questions you should be able to answer after watching the last video were what is imperialism and what motivated imperialism in the 19th century. In this video, we'll be focusing on how did Western European nations come to imperialize nearly all of Africa, India, Southeast Asia, and Oceania? And then what are the lasting legacies of imperialism? So how did Western European nations imperialize nearly all of Africa, India, Southeast Asia, and Oceania? So we'll take these regions one at a time, starting with Africa. So you'll recall from period four, when European nations, starting with Portugal, first started to engage with various kingdoms and societies along the coast of Africa. But by 1875, really the Europeans hadn't made very many inroads into the interior of Africa. Part of the reason for that was there were a number of diseases that would be contracted like malaria. But by 1900, that had all changed. So within about a 25 year window from 1875 to 1900, the entire continent of Africa, except Ethiopia and Liberia was carved up by European nations especially Britain, who's in orange on this map here, in South Africa and in Egypt and down the Nile River, and France, which is located predominantly in West Africa. The reason for the very quick escalation of European interest in Africa is primarily access to natural resources like rubber in the Congo. They were motivated by geographic strategic locations like the Suez Canal in Egypt, the British were. And they were simply motivated by those racist attitudes, the idea that they were bringing civilization to the people of Africa and that was part of this conquest. In 1885, European nations and the United States sent representatives to the Berlin Conference, ultimately to make rules for the imperialism of Africa. So while they didn't actually claim any territory, that would later be done through military occupation and through various land negotiations with various African rulers the Europeans were able to eventually imperialize and control nearly all of Africa. So Europeans had a couple of distinct technological advantages, and that's one of the reasons why they're able to so quickly carve up Africa. First, they could make inroads into Africa with their new transportation technologies, steel, right? They had access to railroads, which they built into the interior of Africa, which allowed them to transport men and supplies. So here you can see a map showing the attempt by the British to build a transcontinental railroad from Cape Town all the way up to Cairo. Ultimately, the plan was foiled by the Germans in East Africa and the Belgians here in Congo. Now, the other major technological advantage they had was in weapons. So by the late 1800s, Europeans had developed a new type of weapon of war, the Maxim gun. And the famous saying, whatever happens, we have got the Maxim gun and they have not. So the Maxim gun or the automatic machine gun was a huge military advantage that the Europeans possessed, which allowed them to you know, quickly defeat Africans who were actively resisting. I mean, you had groups like the Zulus who actively resisted attempts by the British to colonize the region of South Africa, but ultimately they stood no match for the firepower that the Europeans brought with them. So if Europeans weren't settling in these colonial territories in very large numbers, how were they able to maintain control over the people of these regions? And one of the ways that they were able to do it was that they were able to get the cooperation of some of the people within these regions. And in most cases, it was the people who had some sort of power or privilege to begin with. Europeans relied heavily on local leaders to maintain control over their colonies in a process known as indirect rule. So Europeans came in and insisted that they had ultimate power and authority in the region. However, they oftentimes left local rulers, princes, tribal leaders in power in order to maintain a established social hierarchy in the region. 
Now, they did this in a number of ways. For example, in Rwanda, there are two major tribes, the Hutus and the Tutsis. Hutus represented about 85% of the total population in this region of Rwanda. The Tutsis were about 15%. There are certain genetic differences between these two groups that make them distinguishable, the Tutsus being a little bit taller. So the Germans and then later the Belgians placed the Tutsis, the 15%, in charge of Rwanda over the Hutus, the 85%. Well, this is going to become a problem when the Belgians ultimately leave and war breaks out between the Tutsis who had power and the Hutus who were trying to gain power and take power away from the Tutsis, a civil war breaks out that ultimately leads to the genocide in Rwanda in the early 90s. Another way in which Europeans were able to maintain power and privilege for a certain group of people was through offering them European style education. Children like this man right here, Gandhi. Now you may not recognize Gandhi partly because of the hair on his head and also the more Western style attire that he's wearing. You may be more familiar with Gandhi as an older man wearing more traditional Indian clothes. This, we'll see, is a bit of a double-edged sword. So when you offer education to people, it oftentimes makes them aware of the inequalities of their situation. They start to read books about enlightenment ideals. And ultimately, these well-educated leaders are going to lead some of the resistance movements, as we'll see in period six. So let's turn our attention to Oceania. Now, the people living in Australia at the time, the Aborigines, were hunter-gatherers, right? They had lived as hunter-gatherers since all the way back. And they had, again, minimal contact with the rest of the world. They lived in isolation. In 1770, this is going to change with Captain James Cook, who's going to claim Australia and New Zealand for the British. So establishing colonies on the eastern seaboard of Australia. So because of the limited contact between the indigenous peoples and the Maori in New Zealand and the Aborigines in Australia, that many of them are going to die off of diseases. So British colonization and the spread of diseases in the 1800 nearly wipe out the Aboriginal Australian population. That's something like two or three percent of the population today trace their descent through the Aborigines. And the Maori population, which I think is a little bit larger, at about 15% of the population in New Zealand. So we see a lot of similarities, a lot of parallels that we can draw between what happens to the native peoples of the Americas. Those who didn't die of diseases were, in many cases, the United States pushed west. Same thing here in Australia. Those who didn't die were ultimately pushed out into the more western regions of Australia, into the outback, the less hospitable places. So let's turn to India. The last time we were in India, we were discussing the Mughal Empire in period four, the gunpowder empires. We said that was a rare example of unity in India. We talked about Akbar, who was generally tolerant, and then his grandson, Aurangzeb. Well, following the, de the death of Aurangzeb, we saw the arrival and increased influence of the British East India Company. So you can see in pink here, the British East India Company were starting to spread and gain more and more territory and control over the Indian subcontinent. And by 1857, they had established significant control over the entire subcontinent of South Asia. So the British East India Company gradually gained greater control over India. The British East India Company is going to rely on local princes and soldiers, sepoys, to keep control over India. British only represent a very small percentage of the population in India, so they have to rely on indirect rule or local princes and soldiers to maintain control over the region. And this is going to work well as a strategy until 1857, when the Indian Revolt of 1857, sometimes referred to as the Sepoy Rebellion, broke out. And it is an uprising by sepoys, by soldiers of the British East India Company, who are from India, against British East India Company rule. And this really begins with an interesting story of the British were just culturally unaware. So it was triggered by Hindu and Muslim soldiers who were refusing to use cow and pig fat covered bullets. They had to bite the bullets and pull off the cartridges in order to use them. And they were covered with uh, cow fat and pig fat cows being a sacred animal to the Hindus, and so this was offensive to them. There are prohibitions in Islam on eating pork, and so this was offensive to these groups. And ultimately, this leads to an uprising, a rebellion, which was not successful. Uh, ultimately, it's suppressed by the British, 
So after the rebellion is crushed, the British then step in and they dissolve the British East India Company and they take direct control over India themselves, leading to a period of Indian history known as the British Raj, which is going to last from about 1857 until around 1947. Then why were the British so reluctant to give up India? Well, India was really the crown jewel of the British Empire, right? They were extracting enormous amounts of, of resources in the form of cotton for their textile production and opium, which as we'll find out later on, they are selling to China in order to keep control over the Chinese. The story in Southeast Asia is very similar to what happened in Africa and South Asia. So you have various European powers vying for control over the region, and this was really a carryover in some places from period four. So we had already previously seen the Dutch down here in Indonesia, the Spanish had first colonized the Philippines in period four in the 1500s. So let's focus our attention on, though, the mainland. So in the region known as Indochina, because it's located, a very Eurocentric term, located between India and China, uh, the French are going to imperialize in the region today that includes the countries of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. So the French are going to bring Catholicism to the region, cultural diffusion, as we see in every place that's ultimately colonized. We're going to see a French ruling over Indochina until the right before World War II when the Japanese are going to take control. In other parts of Southeast Asia, we had Burma, which was controlled by the British. Siam, very similar to Ethiopia, in that it maintained its independence. The King of Siam basically was able to play the French and the British against one another and, and establish a buffer zone between the two regions. The Malay Peninsula down here was controlled also by the British, who established control over the port of Singapore. So we have the Dutch down here in Indonesia, and you may recall in period four, it was the Dutch who were extracting spices out of these islands and became a very lucrative colony for that reason. And so the Dutch are going to strengthen their control over the East Indies, what is today the modern day country of Indonesia. So what were the lasting legacies of imperialism? In other words, what were the effects of imperialist policies? And they included a number of things. First, more interconnected global trade. We see all this in period four, the beginnings of global trade with the formation of the first maritime empires. It's only going to increase and grow larger as a result of the increased globalization of empires. However, this was not equal or free trade, meaning the imperial powers were oftentimes extracting raw materials, natural resources from their colonies, and then turning around and selling those manufactured goods. And in some cases, regions that had natural resources weren't allowed to even manufacture the goods themselves. So for example, India, which was growing a lot of cotton, was not allowed by the British to manufacture their own textiles. And part of the reason for that was the British wanted to maintain a monopoly essentially over textile production and to control the price at which textiles could be sold. The second major effect of imperialism was increased Western education. As we talked about though earlier, this was really limited to some colonies and was also most importantly limited to a very small kind of subset of privileged people within those colonies. So we're going to see students who receive Western style education oftentimes then later become the leaders of independence movements. So for example, leaders like Gandhi or Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam or Nelson Mandela in South Africa, all of these you know, people who were ultimately educated would later then turn around and recognize the injustice of their situation. And in period six, they are going to lead anti-colonial movements, which is another thing that, that is a long-term effect of imperialism. So the rise of nationalist or anti-colonial rebellions. And here's the kind of tricky thing with nationalism. is these empires under imperialist policies grew larger and more diverse and more global in scale, that ultimately is going to lead many of the colonies which are controlled to reflect back and say, no, we are proud Kenyans, right? We want to be able to do our own thing, or we are proud you know, Indians, and we deserve to govern ourselves. And so there are these major movements based upon principles of self-determination. Now we started to see the beginnings of the stirrings of that in period five with movements like the Sepoy Rebellion of 1857 in India. We're going to see a lot more of this anti-colonial rebellions taking place in period six. So the big questions you should be able to answer after watching these two videos 
were first, what is imperialism? What motivated imperialism in the 19th century? How did Western European nations imperialize nearly all of Africa, India, Southeast Asia, and Oceania? And what were the lasting legacies of imperialism? Thanks for watching.